I'm your host, Aaron Eaton. I'd like to take a moment to thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 44 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 044. Since this is episode number 44 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast, well, we have to give you a special gun of the show. And by special gun of the show, I mean a 44 Magnum. Some, and I do mean some listeners that listen to the show may say, well, he's already talked about the uh, Rossi Ranch and in 44 Mag. What else does he have? For you Dirty Harry fans out there, oh, man, I slaughtered that name, didn't I? For you Dirty Harry fans out there, it's not a Smith & Wesson 29. I'm sorry, but I don't have one of those. I have shot a few of them. I have even shot a few Smith & Wesson Model 6 29s, which, which blah, let me get my tongue untied, which is a stainless steel version. But that's not what I'm talking about here either. This one is stainless steel, but it's not a Smith. In fact, it's a Ruger. It's a Ruger Super Blackhawk in 44 mag. To be more specific, it's a Bisley Hunter variant. You know, a lot of people that know me personally will automatically think of this gun when they hear me talking about taking a handgun when I go hunting. And until I got the Glock 20 SF, it was this one or a similar, albeit blued, 44 mag. This particular revolver is a new model Super Blackhawk Bisley Hunter, which means that it can take a scope. It comes with the uh, it comes with all the stuff to mount a scope. Although I don't have one on it, I should. There may be a future project for us to talk about here: putting a scope on a hunting revolver. Hmm. That would actually make a good evergreen episode. We may do that, and by may, I mean most likely will at some point in the next two or three years. Yeah, I plan long term, especially right now. However, let me say that. Uh, this is a very good gun, and, you know, overall, I'd have to say it's one of my, out of the 44 mags I have owned and shot, it's probably my second favorite. It really is. With that said, let's talk a little bit about the history of the gun. Now, Ruger introduced the single-action Super Blackhawk, the, I'd say the same year that Smith & Wesson introduced their Model 29 double-action revolver in the 44 mag. Now, the 44 Mag Super Blackhawk is popular with hunters due to its deep penetrating capability. However, you know, that's not the thing that most people are interested in the gun about. People are more interested in the rumors and myths that surround its development. But we're not going to talk about those. I want to just throw you some specs and then we're going to get onto the show because I want this to be a short episode. Why? Because a lot of people are not going to be happy with me. And by a lot of people, I mean a lot of open carry advocates are not going to be happy with me. In order to get that out of the way, let me just go ahead and give you the specs. This is Ruger's model number 0862. It is chambered in the 44 mag, and it can shoot the 44 special. It has a capacity of six rounds. It is a single action gun, as I have mentioned more than once. The front sight is a ramped front sight with a red insert. The rear sight is an adjustable sight that, well, you know, it's fully adjustable. It's adjustable for elevation and, uh, you know, to the left and to the right. My mind went blank, sorry. Material, well, it's a stainless steel gun. It has laminate wood grips. It weighs in at a hefty 52 ounces. It has an MSRP of $889. Now, because this is a podcast and can be downloaded years after it will be released, let me just say that this podcast uh, was recorded in January of 2015. MSRP is typically higher than what you'll find at the street price, so don't take the MSRP to be actual cost. It may be more or it may be less than what the actual cost is, depending on when you're listening. And if your dealer subscribes to undercutting the uh, MSRP, because that's kind of why it's priced high, is to give dealers more room to negotiate. Now, with that said, let me run a little audio clip that tells you how to get the show, and then I'll be right back. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Alrighty then. I'm going to talk about a little bit of listener feedback because that ties into the next and main segment of the show. A number of listeners has, have discovered the podcast as a result of episode number 43. Unfortunately, many of them decided I am not radical enough and have sent some rather interesting messages. 
Some of those messages have been the typical, you should podcast to push for open carry or shut up. Mm, I thought I've been doing that, but oh well. And you know, that's been, uh, that's been a significant portion of the comments I received have been of that nature. However, some of the emails have actually contained threats of taking the website offline. Others have accused me of being an NRA or TSRA lapdog. Others were a little more violent and threatening. While the majority of the email I received told me that they appreciated my thoughts on SB342 and that I needed to keep up the good work. People who identified they were from one of the four OC groups I planned to discuss, you know, they tended to send less than positive email. Now, with that said, when I say these people identified they were from one of these four groups, I have no way of knowing for a fact if they were or not. In fact, I'm certain if I forwarded the emails to the leaders of these groups, it'd be, oh, these are not our, these are not our members, because it's never their member when somebody does something wrong. And that's one of the advantages of having a structure that exists strictly on Facebook. You can say, well, this person's a member, but this person that likes the Facebook page isn't. But when it comes time to count membership, you can count all those likes. You can count all those likes as members. So, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things you can you can do what you can do. And I apologize if it sounds like I'm backing away from the mic because, well, I have enough sinus medicine in me to uh, decongest a small army. Unfortunately, I'm still congested. But like I said, you know, there's a lot of uh, email that we got and none of it was truly a positive email experience. It just wasn't. However, I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to bring this into the next level and we're going to run the audio clip that tells you how to get in touch with me on social media. And I want to make people mad at me. And then we'll wrap the show up with a news segment and I'll sign off. And then hopefully my head won't explode from my sinuses. But first, that audio clip. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google Plus. And you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. The title of this show is The Four Horsemen of the Open Carry Activism. Or The Four Horsemen of Open Carry Activism, sorry. I was thinking the four horsemen of the apocalypse, but I kind of got those two mixed up. Now, originally I had planned an entirely different episode. However, events and my sinuses forced me to change plans. Corey Watkins and Open Carry Tarrant County went back to the Capitol on Thursday. They didn't make as big of a stink this time, so that's good. Now, Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick made a number of statements, and Open Carry advocates are once again on the attack. Unlicensed open carry is being checked to see if it's brain dead or not before the plug is pulled on its life support system, while licensed open carry is very much on life support and not expected to make it. Or at least that's how things look to people standing in the waiting room waiting for news on open carry. Now I'm going to really anger people with where I'm going to go with this. Some people will say I'm being blasphemous, but I'm not. I'm just showing you how serious the behavior of these four groups are, and their leadership too. And some people are going to say that I am being insulting to them, and you know what? They're probably right. But at this point, I really don't care. Why? Because these people have done more damage, and they're trying to do more damage, while all in the name of saying they're trying to make progress. And the sad thing is, it's not that they're actually trying to do damage intentionally. It's that they lack the experience, and they have too much excitement and too much zeal for going out there and getting something done. Without knowing how the system actually works, well, you can cause a lot of damage. So let's open up the book of Open Carry. This is the one that is based very much on Revelations. If you listen to the Open Carry crowd and the Gun Control crowd, they actually both kind of agree on that. But in the book of Open Carry, uh, I want to read you a quick passage. And now those of you who are listening and thinking, oh my God, he's not going there. Yes, yes, he is. And I saw, when an experience opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw a white horse called, Come and take it. And he that sat upon it had a righteous fury, and a crown was given unto him. And he went forth into the streets. That's right, I went there. Now, Come and Take It, which is another name for Don'tComply.com, is an organization whose leadership prefers aliases to real names. Katie, Katie is a, the abbreviation for Come and Take It. 
Katie was also a participant in the seemingly weekly Let's Go to the Capitol and Get Arrested events done in support of open carry. They participated in the long gun open carry into businesses, and they did other things that damaged the cause of open carry. In fact, you might say that uh, Katie was one of the uh, more active groups at first. Well, let's move on to the second horseman. And when inexperience had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, called Open Carry Texas. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another's legislation. And there was given unto him a great following, for his name was C.J. Grisham. That's right. There it is. I mentioned C.J. Grisham again. Now, C.J. Grisham is the leader of Open Carry Texas. He himself has sig- done significant amounts of damage, including open carrying a handgun in Oklahoma long after he lost his Texas CHL. I specifically asked that he provide evidence that he actually had a CHL or equivalent license from another state. However, as a result of that, I was accused of being anti-gun. While he said he may or may not have had a license to carry a gun that may or may not have been real. You see, he can make solid definite attacks but then he will go hide behind may or may not haves now to this day i have yet to see proof that he wasn't in oklahoma illegally carrying a handgun all i've uh, seen or heard are may or may nots open carry texas was a key player in it in the seemingly weekly event that you know i have already said let's go to the capitol and get arrested This event was actually considered to be a good idea for making progress on the issue of open carry by the participants. Now, some people may say, this sounds a lot like a post I saw you make in the Texas CHL form, and they would be right. However, let's go on to the third seal. And when inexperience had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat upon him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of reason for a penny, and three measures of Texas carry for a penny. And see thou shall, or see thou help not the NRA and the TSRA, for the name of he that sat upon the black horse was Terry Holcomb. With that said, let's take a look at Terry Holcomb of Texas carry. Now, Terry Holcomb is openly anti-NRA and anti-TSRA, and until recently... He was the most reasonable advocate for open carry in the public eye. However, now that C.J. Grisham has been dealing with the legislature, he's suddenly become reasonable. Things that he was accusing Charles Cotton and Alice Tripp of trying to suppress the open carry movement when they told him, hey, don't do this, is suddenly things that he's saying, hey, we don't need to do this. As a result, Pastor Terry is no longer the most reasonable advocate for open carry in the public eye. He is one of two most reasonable advocates of open carry in the public eye. Now, Pastor Terry was among those arrested at the Capitol in one of the nearly weekly let's go to the Capitol and get arrested stunts that open carry advocates thought were such a good idea. And once again, let me reiterate this. It was not. It did more harm than good. Well, let's get that fourth seal out of the way. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was Corey Watkins. And open carry Tarrant County followed with him. And power was given unto them over a fourth of the earth, to kill with swords, and with actions, and with demands, and with video cameras of those among them. And what they were killing was legislation. I'm sorry to say it, but Corey Watkins, Open Carry Tarrant County, and those with them at the Capitol essentially killed unlicensed Open Carry. They did this in the stunt, or when they went into Poncho Navarro's office and pulled that little stunt there, that's when they did it. In fact, they managed to get Republicans to wear I Am Poncho stickers. And for the record, I understand that, you know, it was a Republican that started that sticker campaign. Before the elections, there were a lot of long gun open carry marches, demonstrations, etc. that generated negative press and pressure on politicians from the public. But the ones that did the most were the ones that where people carried long guns into private businesses, giving Bloomberg's minions, that would be Moms Demand Action, among others, ammunition in the press. But let's go back to when open carry Tarrant County started. They were so radical that they split from OCT, which would be open carry Texas. Now, since they split, and since this stunt in Pancho Navarro's office especially, 
OCT has been doing its best to distance itself from open carry Tarrant County, which is also known as OCTC. Well, let's consider this little fact. Watkins and open carry Tarrant County participate in cop watch and cop block activities while open carrying black powder handguns and long guns. Now, while this is not illegal in and of itself, add in the yelling at police, calling them names, along with trying to make them uncomfortable in general while armed, and you easily have a case for interfering with the public duties of the officers. Now, these are the four horsemen of the open carry movement, and they're not really going out there and getting open carry passed. They're actually going out there and they're getting it killed. Unlicensed open carry is probably, un- I'll be honest, Unlicensed open carry is on life support right now. It's not dead yet, but they're checking it to see if it's brain dead so they can pull the plug. Licensed open carry? Mm, It's on life support, and it's looking pretty grim for it, too. It'll take a lot of work, and it'll take a lot of people, especially these four and their little groups that follow them. It'll take all of that, uh, all these people, to behave. While C.J. Grisham... um, You take Charles Cotton, Alice Tripp, Tara Micah from the NRA. You take all them at the legislature going in, making nice, behaving themselves in the case of C.J. Grisham. And maybe, just maybe, they can save licensed open carry. And maybe even uh, bring unlicensed open carry back to the point that it's not terminally damaged for next session. And if there's a miracle, they might even get unlicensed open carry to pass this session. I doubt it, but maybe. Now, with that said, let me point out one more thing. There are a lot of problems with the unlicensed open carry bills, especially SB 342 with its alterations to 30-06. Those alterations will not fly. I'm sorry, but the legislature won't do it. At the same time, you know, C.J. Grisham's attacking the various bills that that create a 30-07 category well. He says it's not fair to businesses to make them post two big signs. But at the same time, one of his flagship bills, which is attempting to do the same thing as his other flagship bill, it kind of puts a bigger burden on businesses, which you would think he would say it was unfair too, but who knows? I was going to say this on the Texas CHO forum, but I I bit my fingers and kept myself from typing it. But interestingly enough, Charles Cotton pointed it out himself and Here on this podcast, we have a lot of respect for Charles Cotton simply because he's been there and done that a lot in the legislature. So, you know what? Let's go ahead, run the contact info across there, then we can hit the news, which is mostly political, although there is a little bit of criminal activity covered. But for those who don't know how I like to do the news, I try to keep I try to keep us around five news stories, and I think in this one we got six or seven. And I want to say probably All but two of those are uh, political stories. So let me run the audio clip with the contact info and then we'll get to the news and we'll sign the show off. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Alrighty then, it's time for the news here on the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Kicking it off, we have our In Defense of Self and Others category. We have two stories in this category, and the first is a case where a 17-year-old female was shot multiple times and killed after she picked up a courtesy phone and asked to be let into the police station so she could speak to an officer at the Longview, Texas police station. Officials released the video, which confirms accounts that the female was armed with a knife when she was shot and killed. Everybody's talking about it. She was mentally unstable. She was mentally unhealthy. She was mentally ill. All right. If this was known to be the case, why was she not being treated? Why was somebody not making sure that she was getting her treatments? Essentially, is it okay for her to kill a police officer or more while armed with a knife? Or is it more acceptable to shoot and kill her? I don't know about you, but if the police took and, well, are you mentally ill? A lot more police officers would die before learning that, no, they're not mentally ill. If they are mentally ill, maybe it's best that they do not have to uh, go through the world. 
if they're not going to take and do their treatments or be treated, whatever the situation is. I know I'm probably making more people angry with that, but that's one of that's one of the days that I'm living today. Let's just say I'm not feeling well, and when I'm not feeling well, I tend to go out of my way on the podcast to make people unhappy because, well, I don't sugarcoat it. In fact, I went out of my way to go put the sugar coating up. Now, keep in mind that when you listen to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast, we have a very strict limit of how much sugar coating we will do. We are a straight up, honest, and direct podcast, and we will sugarcoat things only as much as necessary to get them to go down. However, days like today, when I have a severe headache, sinuses that are causing that headache running amok, and I have had a very bad week because of things done in the legislature, things don't get sugarcoated at all. But back to the news, because I am rambling. Our second in defense of self and others story comes to us, well, it's out of Smith County, Texas, where a suspect is dead after he attempted to rob a convenience store. Now, the deceased was wearing a mask when he entered the store and exchanged gunfire with the owner. I don't know about you, but if somebody's wearing a ski mask and is shooting with the, or having a shootout with the owner, I don't think they're there to do business. Just saying. <coughs> okay, let's move on to the, pe- uh, to the politics category. Good grief. And we have a story where Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick stated that open carry lacked the votes needed to pass and was not a top priority for the Senate. Interestingly enough, he did not say he was giving up, nor did he say open carry is dead for 2015. Now, the reason I've mentioned this is because he has come under attack from open carry advocates because, guess what? They're saying he has already broken his campaign promise. He didn't promise to get it passed. He promised to support it. And the fact that there's not enough votes, he may have made that statement to help drum up the votes or drum up support. Don't write off that he isn't trying to support it because he's telling you the truth. But let's move on to uh, the next story, which is also about Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick, who released a statement on Senate Bill SB11 or SB11, which is the 2015 legislative session version of the Campus Carry Bill. Now, this bill has been assigned to the State Affairs Committee, and the bill's author already has 19 co authors, meaning it will go to the floor for passage to the House. All it has to do is go through committee and be voted out favorably. And, you know, I think Dan Patrick pretty much sent it to the right committee to have that happen. Now, the link in the show notes will go. Excuse me, I had to back off and sneeze. The link in the show notes will take you to the uh, Twitter announcement, which contains an image of the press release. Now, having learned some lessons, open carry advocates wore empty holsters or holsters containing other items such as fruit, copies of the United States Constitution, and similar such items to protest the ban on open carry of modern handguns here in Texas. I would say this is a far more uh, effective form of protest than marching around with long guns screaming shall not be infringed. But, you know, who am I to say anything? I'm just a guy with a radio uh, voice and a microphone. And then we come to the story where Poncho Navarez, a member of the Texas House of Representatives, now has a security detail to protect him after he received threats following the incident with Corey Watkins and the open carry Tarrant County bunch that was walking around with him. And in a related story, as a show of solidarity, many many legislators in the Texas House wore stickers with the words, I'm Poncho. Now this is all coming about after he received the threats mentioned in the previous story. And the reason he received those threats is because he does not support unlicensed open carry. I find it interesting that the news article specifically says unlicensed open carry. He may actually support licensed open carry based on that article. I don't know. I know the guy is not in the NR, is not uh, ESRA A plus rated, but he may not be completely anti gun. He may actually think, well, I'll support licensed open carry just to stick it to the unlicensed open carry supporters. I don't know. However, the article also explains why some lawmakers are hesitant to vote in favor of any open carry legislation as a result of the incident between Poncho Navarez and open carry Tarrant County. Keep in mind, the article mentions licensed and unlicensed open carry, and it specifically says Poncho Navarez uh, was being threatened because of his position on unlicensed open carry. It's interesting that that's being made as a distinction in the article. It really is. It makes me wonder, does he support licensed open carry, or is he so adamant that he's on the attack against the unlicensed open carry because of the attack on him? 
And by the attack on him, I mean the threats, the yelling, the pissy fit in his office. I'll be honest, I've seen three-year-olds better behave than Corey Watkins in open carry Tarrant County. However, that wraps up our news article. And this is going to be a very short episode, so let me run the sign-off music, and then I may I may mention something at the end. Give me a second to see if I lose my voice or not before then. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe, and please carry responsibly. Well, for the final segment of the show, the post uh, the post sign off music credit segment, I think we'll call it. I'm going to give you a very brief discussion on the podcast. I am currently working on a number of things to improve the podcast, including finding a better uh, well finding a better sinus medicine. I am also working on upgrading the recorder so that the short little segment we did doesn't eat a significant portion of the batteries you see the recorder that i have been using kind of was damaged in the rollover of my jeep in the last few episodes i've recorded has been done with the whole concept that well maybe i just got some bad batteries but this time i checked the lot numbers on the packages they're whole different lot numbers and the batteries are almost gone already i've done this episode on these batteries and i've done some audio testing on these batteries now, you may be wondering why, why I would be doing audio testing when the system's set up. It's working rather well. That's because I've been testing some different configuration options so that I can have... Ooh, the recorder almost died a couple of times there, so I better hurry this up. Basically, I am working on getting some audio capabilities on a new recorder that will give me a little better capability when it comes to editing, say, a interview, among other things. With that said, let me go ahead and sign off before the recorder dies from dead batteries. So please, carry responsibly and stay safe. Yeah, I changed it up at least once.